On April 12, 1963, special effects pioneer Eiji Tsuburaya officially founded and established Tsuburaya Productions, where he planned to reduce his own film and television projects separate from his then-current projects at Toho. Eiji Tsuburaya was, and still is, famous for his work on Toho's science fiction films such as the original Godzilla, Rodan, The Mysterians, and Mothra. However, Tsuburaya had been planning these independent projects as early as 1962, where he and his team were planning a science fiction television series called Wu for Fuji Television. Unfortunately, the Wu project ended up falling through, but thankfully Tsuburaya had been preparing another proposal called Unbalance for another Japanese station, TBS, in the background. Unbalance was planned to be inspired by Western sci-fi shows such as The Twilight Zone and The Outer Limits, but due to Tsuburaya's background in kaiju films, the suits at TBS requested that the show be more focused around giant monsters. The change in direction also came with a name change, inspired by the ultra-sea gymnastics technique that had become popular during the 1964 Summer Olympics. The finished work, brought to Japanese households under the name Ultra Q, became a cultural phenomenon overnight, and kicked off the hugely successful Ultra series. But it wasn't quite as we know it yet, because Ultra Q was missing something that every series afterwards would center around. Now let's fast forward a couple of years to 1965. The unprecedented success of Ultra Q inspired TBS producers to commission Tsuburaya for a sequel series. At that time, TBS gave Tsuburaya four requirements for their next series. 1. Consideration of color production for overseas sales. 2. Establishment of an official agency to naturally unfold the plot by handling monster incidents. 3. A just kaiju capable of fighting and standing on equal footing with other kaiju. 4. Retention of at least one regular actor from Ultra Q in the sequel. And from those four requirements, the groundwork for the next Ultra series had been laid out. The first concept Tsuburaya proposed for this new series was called Science Special Search Party Bemular, and already featured concepts familiar to the final product, such as the hero monster merging with a human host. Bemular, however, was far different from Ultraman in pretty much every way, his concept art showing a Birdman creature inspired by the Karasu Tengu of Japanese mythology. Unfortunately for Bemular, this concept ended up being dropped when some pointed out that Bemular's design would make it hard for new viewers to distinguish him from enemy kaiju, and overall it just didn't convey the characteristics of a heroic figure well enough. After Bemular ended up being dropped, the proposal was further developed into Science Special Search Party Redman, which featured the first appearance of a more humanoid hero. Redman was conceived as an alien refugee from a planet destroyed by an invasion from the aliens of Planet X. This proposal also introduced the Flash Beam, a transformation device that would allow the human host to transform into Redman. While Tsuburaya's Redman proposal did end up being picked up for production, it would encounter many changes along the way, including Redman's design and the name of the series itself. When the series finally made it to Japanese television in the summer of 1966, it quickly surpassed its predecessor in ratings, and carried with it a title that would forever embed itself in Japanese pop culture, Ultraman. And that, my friends, is where it all started. But wait, I think I'm getting ahead of myself, because I was supposed to use this video to explain what an Ultraman is. The people yearn for it, you see. So with the Ultraman lore dump out of the way, what exactly is Ultraman? Well, Ultraman is a Japanese special effects series created by Tsuburaya Productions. As I mentioned earlier, the first Ultra series that featured an Ultra Warrior was produced way back in the 1960s, and since then, Tsuburaya Productions, who I'll be referring to as Supro from here on out for the sake of making the script a little easier to read, has put out a long line of Ultra series shows, and it's still ongoing to this day. The current series is Ultraman Arc, and by the way, check out my first impressions if you haven't seen them already. It's pretty good. And it's just the latest entry in the Reiwa era of Ultra shows, following the older Heisei and Showa series. Ultraman is huge in not just Japan, but in pretty much all of Eastern Asia. In fact, it's actually one of the top 50 highest grossing media franchises in the world. Despite that, the series is still relatively niche in the West. Which is of course why I'm making this video. So, where to begin with how this works? Ah yes, how about the episode format? So Ultraman episodes are usually what you'd call Monster of the Week in terms of format, although it doesn't always play out the same way. Sometimes an episode builds up to the kaiju, sometimes the kaiju's appearance is what starts the episode, and rarely the episode doesn't feature a kaiju at all. Regardless of how an episode plays out, it almost always ends with the appearance of an Ultra Warrior to beat the kaiju's ass. This usually plays out through the human host transforming into the Ultra, although how the human host transforms changes between series. The human host is usually the main protagonist of the show, although in some cases there can be more than one host in a show. Ultraman Ace being a great example of this. 
On the topic of characters, usually the plot of an episode is driven by the series' resident defense team. In-universe, the defense team is an organization that exists solely to handle mysterious incidents, kaiju attacks, alien invasions, and what have you. They usually consist of a team of characters who work together and have individual personalities to flesh out episodes outside of the wonderful special effects. But that's not to say the defense teams don't contribute to those special effects, either. They often have access to highly advanced weapons such as jets, submarines, drill tanks, and even laser guns to handle almost anything thrown at them. Despite all that advanced tech, it's usually up to the Ultra Warrior of the series to actually finish off Kaiju. As of the recent Reiwa series, Supro has cut back on using full-fledged defense teams like the older shows, but usually this is because of budget constraints. So how does Ultraman fight Kaiju? Well, if we're looking at this from the broadest point of view possible, then it's with chops, punch, kicks, throws, you know, standard stuff. But that's a very boring way of describing it. And looking deeper requires us to understand that, hey, every Ultra fights differently. Some examples would be Ultraman Ace, who likes to use moves that cut and slash his opponents, and Ultraman Leo, who mixes a whole slew of martial arts techniques into his fighting style. Since the Heisei era, Ultras tend to have form changes that alter their appearance and enhance their abilities in some way. Ultras even have a unique finishing move, which usually ends up being a defining trait of their character, such as Ultra 7's Eye Slugger and most famously Ultraman Spaceship Beam, which future heroes have had many different variations on. The most important part of any Ultraman fight, however, is an Ultra's color timer. Ultras can only spend so much time in Earth's atmosphere, specifically around 3 minutes, although most shows don't really stick to this and it seems to just last however the show needs it to last. The color timer acts as a warning light for when an Ultra is almost out of time on Earth, and it exists basically to add an element of tension to the series. In fact, the original color timer was a last-minute addition to the original Ultraman series, as the production team was concerned that Ultraman appeared too invincible, as he lacked a readily apparent weakness. And, funnily enough, if you look on the Ultraman suit during his original Rise sequence, you can see there isn't a color timer on the chest. Neat, huh? So, with all of that said, why do I love Ultraman? And why should you love it too? Well, the obvious answer to that is that I just love Tokusatsu in general, but I guess my real answer would be that the series offers so much variety. Every series is unique in its own way, and I really feel there's something for everyone in here. Drama, romance, action, mystery. The Ultra series offers so much more than just giant monsters, and no matter your tastes, age, gender, or whatever defining characteristic you have, you're bound to find something worthwhile in this series. I personally feel Ultraman transcends the tokusatsu foundations that define it so well, and I also feel that the series proves that Japanese special effects are an art form that deserve more praise from Western viewers. And that old, haha <laughs> guys in rubber suits jumping on cardboard buildings mindset is quite inaccurate, personally. The Ultra series define an entire genre of television, and whether it defines you the same way it defined me, well, you'll just have to see if it clicks with you too. Well, I guess that'll be it for this video. Fuck, has it really been two whole months since I last uploaded anything? Wow, I'm super sorry about that. I'll try to get back to a more reasonable upload schedule soon, but... I'm starting a new full-time job in a couple of weeks, so I'm really gonna have to think about how to balance the YouTube and work life properly. The next video should be the Ultraman Tara review I've been building up to for a while now, but after that, I think I'm gonna take a short break from Ultraman and talk about a game or two that I really love. Anyways, thanks for watching, and don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and join the Sandwich Face Discord linked in the description down below. Until next time, gamers!